Hello everyone, welcome to the Course of History. My name is Rocio and today's video is going to be all about Christopher Columbus and the situation in Europe during the 15th century. So a lot of things changed during this time in Europe. Social changes, political changes, as well as some new technological advances. And all of these played a role in helping Christopher Columbus take that famous voyage in 1492. And so in today's video we're going to look at those and see exactly how Europe emerged from the dark ages and into this new era that eventually led to further exploration and eventually colonization. So I hope you enjoyed the video. Please don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe. I really appreciate it when you do that. And let's get started. So the 15th century in Europe was a time of transition. Europe was leaving behind the ideals and practices of the Middle Ages and ushering in a new era. And all of these changes played a role in helping Christopher Columbus take that famous voyage. But even though Europe was changing and moving forward, they were still dealing with the effects of two major events that began in the previous century and were still taking a toll on society. So the first event swept through China in the early 1300s, killing half of the population. From there it moved westward and in 1347 the bubonic plague arrived in the ports of Sicily. From there it spread into Italy and then all throughout Europe. The disease was carried by rats and it was transmitted to humans by fleas. After being bitten, a person would usually die within days and it is estimated that the bubonic plague killed one third of Europe's population. This epidemic was so deadly that entire villages were wiped out and mass graves had to be used to bury the dead. The second event began in 1328 after the death of Charles IV of France. Charles was the last living son of Philip IV and he had no sons of his own, so after his death there was no one to take over the French throne. Charles did have a sister though and her name was Isabella. She was the mother of Edward III who was the King of England. Edward was the closest male relative to Charles and he thought that he should be the King of France, but Salic law disqualified Edward's claim to the throne because it was through his mother's line and so the throne was given to Philip VI, who was Charles's cousin. So Edward was furious about this and refused to acknowledge Philip as the King of France. Philip responded by confiscating the English territories in France, which led to the Hundred Years' War. The war began in 1337 and it involved several generations of both English and French kings claiming their rights to the throne. Throughout the war, England won many decisive battles, but in 1429 at the Siege of Orleans, the French, with the help of Joan of Arc, turned the tide. The struggle ended in 1453, and by that time, both England and France had suffered great losses and casualties, and England had lost all but one of its land possessions in France. The effects of the Hundred Years' War went further than just the decimation of Europe's population. It also destroyed the governing system that had been in place since the 9th century. During the Middle Ages, feudalism governed and structured society through the allocation of land. At the very top was the king who awarded land grants to his nobles in exchange for support and service. These nobles then parceled out a portion of their lands to lesser lords called vassals who served as knights during times of war, and these vassals in turn contracted peasants to farm the land in exchange for protection. So even though this system provided each class with what they needed, it thrived on inequality and the exploitation of the peasant class. Not only did they have to do backbreaking work on the land of the vassals, but the peasants also had to pay tolls and taxes to live on that land. In the aftermath of the war, however, this system began to crumble and it was largely due to the sense of nationalism that emerged because of the fighting. Monarchs capitalized on this sentiment and began unifying previously divided lands under their royal authority, making the feudal system obsolete. So the most successful of these unifications happened in Spain. In 1469, Ferdinand of Aragon married Isabella of Castile and unified their lands under one authority. From there, they focused on expanding their kingdom by incorporating independent territories under their reign and on driving out the Muslims who had occupied Spain since 711. In 1492, they finally conquered the last Moorish kingdom of Granada and expelled all of the Muslims from Spain. The reign of Ferdinand and Isabella not only unified Spain under Christian rule, but also elevated Spain to a dominant world power. 
The 15th century also brought new technological innovations to Europe. Johannes Gutenberg was born in the late 1390s in Mainz, Germany. He was a goldsmith by profession, and in the late 1430s, he began developing a more reliable method for printing books. Back then, books were really expensive to own because of the amount of time it took to make one, but Gutenberg's invention changed all of that. The Gutenberg Press used movable blocks of letters and symbols to create the words on a page. After that was complete, the arrangement would be attached to the printing press and then printed onto the paper. Gutenberg's invention facilitated the mass production of books and allowed everyone to have access to them, which led to the spread of information and ideas among the masses. One book in particular captured the attention of many Europeans and helped spark a greater interest in the Far East. The book was called The Travels of Marco Polo and it was published in 1477. In his book, Marco describes the exotic lands of the Middle East, his stay in the courts of the Kublai Khan, and his travels to Tibet and Burma in the Mongol Empire. Marco also describes China as a country bordering an ocean, and this led many Europeans to believe that China could be reached by sea. If this was true and a transoceanic route did exist, Europe would be able to trade directly with Asia and bypass the Muslim and Venetian merchants who control the goods coming along the Silk Roads. So these newly powerful monarchs wanted access to Asian goods like silks, gold, and spices, and new advances in navigation and sailing made the exploration for an oceanic route possible. Italians and Portuguese were both leading forces in seafaring. In Portugal, Prince Henry the Navigator established a school devoted to navigation and expeditions, and by 1492, Portuguese mariners were rounding the African continent, sailing closer and closer to Asia. One well-established seafarer was Christopher Columbus. He was born in 1451 in Genoa, Italy. He was the eldest son of Domenico Columbus, who was a wool worker by profession. Columbus began his career as a seaman with the Portuguese merchant marine, and he sailed to several Portuguese outposts, including Madeira. By the 1480s, Columbus had become an experienced map maker and sailor, and began looking for funding for a transatlantic crossing. After being rejected by King John II of Portugal, Columbus approached the Spanish monarchs Ferdinand and Isabella, who agreed to finance his voyage. On August 13, 1492, Columbus set sail from the Spanish ports of Palos, and two months later, on October 12, he landed on an island in the Bahamas, which he named San Salvador. After their arrival, Columbus and his men encountered the Tainos, who were the indigenous people of the Caribbeans. They had thriving communities in the Dominican Republic, Jamaica, Cuba, Puerto Rico, and other islands in the Bahamas. The Tainos cultivated a wide variety of crops, including sweet potatoes, maize, and beans. They made pottery and used large ocean-going canoes for travel. The Tainos welcomed Columbus and his men and were very generous towards them. Columbus explored five of their islands before exploring the island of Cuba. From there, he sailed to the island of Haiti, which he renamed La Española. There, he established a small settlement called La Navidad, and from there, Columbus returned to Spain. Columbus returned to Spain in the spring of 1493, and his findings led to the approval for a second voyage. He returned to La Española in October of 1493 with orders to Christianize and colonize the region. Until his death in 1506, Columbus believed he had reached the Far East, and he died never understanding the lasting effects his voyage would have on history. Columbus's voyage introduced the Eastern Hemisphere to a whole new world with different foods, cultures, and people. As a result, other European countries began their own colonizing expeditions, which resulted in the exploitation of the natives and the resources of the Americas. Ultimately, Columbus's voyage changed the course of history forever. <laughs>